Hey everyone, how are you? It is Tuesday night. Tuesday night, well it's Wednesday here, but uh, there is no Trish show tonight. Nope, no Trish show tonight. She is, uh, I don't know, probably stealing monkeys again. That's what I think anyway. Uh, she's probably off in a zoo somewhere. Uh, let's start the show off by uh, acknowledging what happened in Baltimore. My god, I... <laughs> I was up yesterday after the late show and I started seeing everyone talking about a bridge on uh, on Twitter and I was like, a bridge? Why is everyone talking about a bridge? And then all of a sudden people are like, no, no, the bridge collapsed. And I was like, really? And yeah, it, it is brutal. I, I know everyone's probably seen it by now, but I just couldn't believe it when I saw the uh, footage. I'm going to show you a couple of... Uh, screenshots that I I took from the local news we're not going to do much on this because of um yeah because of everyone's probably seen it but these were some of the daytime shots from uh WMAR in Baltimore or Maryland and you can see look there's nothing left this uh this ship hit the pylon and down she went she did not come back up, and unfortunately, they're saying six people have now officially lost their lives. They d it is not a uh, search and recovery mission anymore. They're basically looking for bodies. <clears throat> unfortunately, they are looking for uh, remains of people. They they don't believe they are alive anymore due to how cold it is, due to how bad the drop and the debris in the water and the limited oxygen so yeah there you go there's what's left of uh the the france the francis scott key bridge and apparently this was a main bridge people used it every day they you know it was a a key a key uh road for people to get to and from work and different places uh it's going to be a while before it comes back up i reckon it is quite frightening you know it is a nightmare. I, I can't believe it when I saw it. I have never seen anything like it. Not not in the Western world anyway. I mean, I've seen things happen in other countries, like in, in the East, but not in America, not in Australia. You know, very, very concerning. Uh, also, Julian Assange has been given a delay so yeah there was a whole bunch of updates this is maria she liked all these thanks maria uh yeah i don't know what baltimore is going to do for a, a year while they wait to rebuild this bridge they're going to have they've got another bridge that's further down it's either a bridge or a tunnel but it's a little further down the river uh they can use that but when you try and divert 50 percent of your traffic load onto another <laughs> another road or tunnel that that is supposed to help this bridge you know divert traffic you're just asking for trouble aren't you just asking for trouble uh anika said power failed yes in the video if you watch it carefully you can see the uh the lights on the ship go and then they come back on and they go again and they turn off so there was obviously some power steering something the uh the investigators will figure it out and give us a full report at some point and uh we'll figure out how this happened not not the type of uh news you'd like to see at all let me say hello to everyone let me say hello i, I didn't see everyone dj was here first he gets a medal Lori is here she says haven't heard about either topic good yeah we got a lot of topics tonight uh, Peekaboo Cockatiel, hey, how are you? Shad Hunter, good to have you. Marilyn Lander says, I I bought some Girl Scout cookies. Ooh, Girl Scout cookies. This past Sunday at the grocery store, didn't have Thin Mints, so got trefoils, shortbread cookies. Ah, oh, they are good, right? They are yum. Uh, Lindy, hey, Lindy. Uh, who else have we got? LMS. LMS says, hey, at Ping and everyone, I did get the job. She sent the email late. See, believe in Ping, and Ping will see you through. 
I told you you would get the job, and I told you you should follow it up. Uh, my advice works. <laughs> the, the the love of the chat and ping gets you your job. Congratulations, LMS eighty three. I'm glad you got your new job right before Easter. That's really cool. Uh, Marylinda says, watching a movie, Stolen Baby, The Murder of Heidi Broussard, recorded it. I haven't seen that one. Uh, Sienna, hey, Sienna. Kelly in Texas. Oh, by the way, Sienna, I saw your message on the late show last night. I had just hit the power on the late show. I was like, just end show. And then I read your message and I was like, oh, no, uh, I am really sorry to hear about your sister. And I, I'm sorry we didn't address that last night. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to bring that back up, but I felt bad for not addressing it on the show last night. Um, yeah, if there's anything we can do, just let us know. And if you have to, you know, go away for a little while or whatever, we totally get it. Totally get it. I hope you and your family are coping somehow. I really do. That must be very difficult. Very difficult. Um, Sean, how are you? Good to see you, Mr. Budgie. I hate mornings and Emily Narb and Moonlight View. She has what is that? I'm trying to. What is that in her Moonlight View? What is that thing in her picture? Is it soap? Is it a cherry? Is it a? Is it a tomato? I don't know. Nancy S and Laura G are here. Good to see you both. Annika is here. Marlene Clawson. I'm trying to see who I've missed. Emily Nob, no, we got Emily, Peekaboo, Jojo's here, Diane Marie, I'm just seeing if we've got everyone, I think we've got everyone but Penguin, hey Penguin, mar, mar, mar. the Penguin dance, mar, mar, mar. Um, Diane Marie says, didn't get any Girl Scout cookies this year and received a thank you from my hips, oh, fair enough, all right, all right, all right, no more ship, no more ship. Um, all we can say is I, I hope Baltimore finds a way to, one, get the bodies back for the families. That That is horrible. Those people that died, they weren't uh, pedestrians or people in a the car. They were actually working the night shift to fix the bridge. They weren't people traveling in you know vehicles or whatever. They were doing a job. And that is very sad. That'll actually go against the... Uh, you know, workers who died at work tally for Baltimore. And that's very sad, very dramatic as well. Um, Their families must be beside themselves. You don't expect to go to work and then get a phone call at 2.30 in the morning saying that, yeah, we think your loved one who was working on the bridge project is now somewhere in the water and we don't know where. And uh, because it's dark and murky, we ain't going to go in until the morning. That's literally what they said last night. I heard it on the radio. They said, we're not going to do any search and rescue tonight uh, unless it's on the top of the water. We're not going to send divers in until the morning. So chance of survival, very, very slim. And uh, those families out there must be suffering today. So keep keep them in your thoughts, really do. The city of Baltimore needs your good vibes and loving thoughts right now especially those families of the people who were killed. All right. Let me get you uh, one of our stories for tonight. No, it is not about a clothes rack. That is not what's going on. All right. Here. Hampton County, Westfield, Holyoke. Police seeking public's help in locating missing child. This is a photo of her here. Her name is Macy Ryan, but also goes by the name Jasmine. Was last seen in Canby Street area of Holyoke, but has ties to Westfield. There's a really nice photo of her. That's a great photo. Uh, It looks like a school photo. That's a really uh, great photo of this missing teenager. It says she was last seen wearing a green sweatshirt, black pants, and is described by police as being 4 foot 10 with a Thin build, no further information was provided. Okay. It says, if you know where she is, please contact detective. the detectives at 413-642-9385. And or you can contact all these things here. Hold on. I'll put these in the chat. 
There's too many for me to read out. Yeah, I know it's a great photo. Nice to see a good photo for once for, for a missing person. Here we go. There you go. You can contact the detective on his uh, mobile number or email or the Holyoke Police Department or text a tip by dialing. How do you dial a text? I think they mean by texting. It says text a tip by dialing. No. Text a tip by texting 533-TIPS or 533-8477. People got to proofread their, their articles. All right. That's all I have for her, unfortunately. But hey, we got a missing young person. We've got to get it out there as quick as we can and uh, get her face out there. Hey, you might be walking down to the shop and you might see her and then you can call it in and uh, she'll get home to her family. That would be really good. Now, I did already search this before we were live and I did not see any updates, like anything to say that she was found or like nothing like that. I, I didn't see anything on Twitter. I'll just have a quick look again. Because sometimes it is very, especially with young people when they go missing, it can be very fast moving. One minute they're missing, the next minute they're found. Nope, I do not see an update. So she is still currently outstanding. So she is last seen in the Canby Street area of Holyoke and has ties to Westfield. Her name is Macy Ryan, but also goes by the name Jasmine. Don't know why. Maybe it's just like a nickname or something. I'm not sure how you get Jasmine from Macy, but could be just a nickname. It's like when they give a nickname Bubba to a kid and you're like, how did he get that? His name's Matt. And you're like, yeah, well, he was a, he was a chubby little kid. And so who knows? There's probably a story there. But if you know her or have seen her, what area is this? Hampton County. Okay, Westfield and Holyoke Police Department. What state is this? I'm getting lost. Oh, Massachusetts. Holyoke, Massachusetts. Okay, there we go. That's the state, M-A. So Holyoke, M-A. The zip code is 01040, I think. Uh, that's, yeah. And they're the police department. Let me check it out. Let me see if there's anything on their uh, their website. There might be. Online scheduling for new LTC firearm applications. No, that's not what we want. <laughs> we don't want that. We want missing person. No, I don't see anything on their, their news. No. Okay. No. So just just this photo. Hold on. Let me fix her face. There we go. Sorry about that. There's her face. Hey, Bizarre Life. How are you? Yeah. Th there's people in vehicles and all sorts of uh things. Oh yeah, uh yeah, the uh her dog is is hurt. He's got a sore back or something. Uh probably playing with uh with the uh the other dog Bug. I think uh Scrappy was probably mucking around and probably fell funny. You know, with sausage dogs you've got to be very careful with their back. So no, I don't think that's why she's away for business. She's doing something. Um, I'm not privy to that information. I don't know what, where she is. Even if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Uh, she's she's away. She'll be back on Thursday. Yeah, there we go. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. There we go. Massachusetts. So if you miss that, I can uh, quickly go over it again. Not a ton of information, but there's her photo. You know, it says right here, these plants are now banned in Massachusetts. And I'm like, what state is this? What <laughs> what country? Uh, it says Westfield and the Holly Oak area. She also is known by the name Jasmine. 
So not a ton of information. This is a, a trend I've seen in teenage missing person. They'll, they'll give you maybe a name, maybe a location, and then they'll just say they're missing. They don't give you much more other than that. I don't know why. Maybe for privacy reasons? I don't, I'm not sure. So if you know where she is, please call it in. Even when I search Twitter, there's like nothing about it. There's like two posts. That's it. All right. If I hear anything else about Jasmine slash Macy, I will let you know. So let's move on. And I have some updates. I uh, got a couple. We got a little bit more information about the pregnant Amish woman. We have a guy, a murderer from Australia. He liked to call himself the Hand of Death. And he would murder people. I mean, that doesn't sound, you know, kosher to me. You're calling yourself the Hand of Death. That is pretty brutal. We're going to talk about him. And we have a little girl who died, unfortunately, after she was sucked into a pipe in a swimming pool. And um, EquiSearch were there. They, they, had, they tried to rescue her, but she drowned, unfortunately, and she died due to massive trauma. We're going to talk about her very briefly and let you know what kind of little girl she was. I think if we could share that, that would be really nice, you know, when these kids died. The least we can do is talk about who they were and show their photo. Um, where is my link? I had this all set up and then kaboom. As soon as we go live, it all implodes. Where is my link about the hand of death guy? All right, hold on. Don't know why that disappeared. Ah, here we go. I found it. So he's called a man the, wanted in connection with. Hey, his name is the Hand of Death. Kevin Pettiford's brutal and senseless murder of homeless men. It says a man who called himself the Hand of Death and aspired to be one of Australia's most prolific serial killers had a liking for killing homeless men. It says. Uh, he he has been jailed for 35 years for brutally murdering a homeless man. Kevin James Pettiford appeared in the New South Wales Supreme Court on Wednesday after being found guilty of murder and attempted murder. The jury determined that he had killed homeless man Andrew White Murray, 53, at Tweed Heads in the state's far north in November 2019. On Wednesday, the uh, Justice Hamnet uh, Dungy said... It was a brutal and senseless murder that showed Pettiford's complete lack of humanity. He said Pettiford had acted on the entirely abhorrent view that Murray's life was worth less because he was basically homeless and sleeping rough. Here's a photo of Kevin Pettiford, murdered the homeless man and a fellow inmate in jail. Likes to call himself the Hand of Death. The man had been entirely defenseless when the so-called Hand of Death grabbed a rock from a nearby seawall and repeatedly smashed it into his skull. Five weeks later, the jury found Pettifed had slashed the throat of fellow inmate Nathan Mellows while in custody at Shortland Correctional Centre. It was accepted during the trial that Pettifed had also killed homeless man David Collin, 53, on Queensland's Sunshine Coast in 2019. He told police he had killed by a code and preyed on homeless men because he believed no one cared about them. He told the court, uh, he told police, I love killing. Pettifed called his murders art and labelled himself the hand of death. The justice said Pettifed had admitted to uh, a long-held desire to kill and showed a disregard for human life by following through on his homicidal ideation. He did not display anything that could be described as remorse. Nope. Pettifed argued that he had been mentally impaired at the time of the brutal acts, but the jurors found he was criminally responsible. It is clear in the jurors' verdict that he knew what he was doing was wrong. He could reason with at least 
a moderate degree of composure. He sentenced Pettiford to 35 years behind bars, backdated to when he was arrested in November 2019. His jail term will expire on November 25th, 2058, but he will be eligible for parole in 2045. Pettiford sat slumped with his head downcast and twirled his beard with his fingers while the Supreme Court Justice described his vicious crimes. He wore a green prison tracksuit and maintained a blank expression as he learned his fate. Uh, I think any time you describe yourself as the hand of death, I, I mean, nothing good is going to come from that. And the fact he then tried to say it was a mental health issue. Uh, maybe, but I, I think your lack of remorse is more telling than your mental health issues. The fact that you feel no remorse and showed no remorse at trial is a bigger indicator than you're trying to say it was a mental health issue. Because if you had showed any uh, sorrow for the people you had killed, any concern for their family, maybe that would go towards you having been in a state of, uh, you know, mental illness at the time. But the fact that it seems like your mental Ill- your mental state now is almost matched to when you killed these people and that you couldn't give a stuff that you killed them because they were homeless. I don't think the jury believed that you were mentally ill at the time. I think you probably thought, what if I kill a bunch of people and then tell the jury that I was mentally insane? They will definitely let me off and I will definitely be a free man and I can go kill more people. Well, no. The jury did not believe your crap, and you have been jailed for 35 years. You will not probably not be a free man. Uh, he's, how old is he? Doesn't say. Okay, thanks for that article. I don't know if it says how old he is. Let's see, it, do, it doesn't actually say. Man who called himself, all right, hold on. Let's see how old he'll be when he finishes jail. Kevin Pettiford. Let's see. Okay, let's see if we can find out a bit more information about him. Uh, 38 years old. And if he's not going to be released, like, plus 35 years, he's going to be over 70 by the time he is released on parole. He might be 65 if he gets the 45, uh, 2045 parole. So still a chance at life, which I think is wrong. But uh, hopefully the the um, parole board will not give him any parole because... He probably won't feel any remorse by then either. It says here, prosecutors are seeking a life sentence for a man who bashed a rough sleeper to death simply because he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Kevin James Pettiford said he went back and forth in his mind about whether to kill 56-year-old Andrew Murray, who in November 2019 was sleeping, sleeping rough in Tweed Heads in far north New South Wales. The 38-year-old was arrested soon after, intentionally bashing Murray to death with several large rocks, making a full confession to investigators. Here's him on the uh, court cam. I mean, not court cam, body cam at the time. That definitely looks like Queensland. It says, A jury rejected a plea of not guilty on the grounds of mental impairment in December, finding Pettiford guilty of one count of murder, and one count of attempted murder over a later incident in which he attacked a fellow inmate. Uh, The the justice said it was a brutal, callous killing, uh, failing in in my submission in the worst category. It represented a denial of Murray's humanity. Pettiford sat hunched in the dock wearing prison greens as the court weighed his fate. He pointed to Pettiford having weighed up whether to commit the murder as evidence the attack was premeditated and that the killer was not in the grips of a manic episode. Yeah, he basically shot himself in the foot with that. The fact that he was able to uh, clearly 
articulate to police that he had moments of clarity saying, well, should I kill him? Should I not? Yeah, why not? Let's kill him. Um, that shows you that that is not a mental illness and not in a manic episode because someone who is in that state probably would have just killed them uh, without a second thought. I mean, it probably doesn't pass the test, which we have talked about before. Hold on. Um, my nice friend who helped me write my insanity plea video is probably screaming at me right now. Ping, we talked about this for three hours. Uh, hold on, let me find out. Ah, uh, yes. They have a they have a couple of different things they can weigh it on. It's the I'm probably going to say say this wrong. Uh, the McNaughton rule or the Durnham rule, and these are different ways they can, uh, you know, weigh what the uh, what the criminal has done. You know, it's sort of like a means test of of criminal insanity. So he probably would not have passed either of those two things, and uh, the jury didn't believe it either. You know, we really have to release that video for you all. Malice afterthought, definitely. Hey, Lisa, how are you? It is nice. Are you are you on leave for for uh, Easter already? Uh, yeah, actually, how's everyone going? It's almost Easter. I hope everyone is starting to get a little in the Easter mood. Let me know in the chat. Like, what are you going to do on this weekend? Are you are you going to go see family? Like, what are you up to? Let me know. I'd like to hear your stories of what you're going to do. But you have me all weekend this weekend. Uh, we will, I'll be doing a show every day over the long weekend. So that'll be a lot of fun. I'm not doing, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, unfortunately, our family is away. So I will be here. Let me see if I can find something more on this guy. The fact that he named himself the Hand of Death is disturbing in itself. Uh, let me see. Apparently not. Apparently they don't want to give me any videos on this guy. It says, Twisted murderer who bashed a homeless man to death boasted about his desire to become Australia's most prolific serial killer. Well, you're a failure. You only killed one guy. You didn't do so well. You're ambitious, but rubbish. So, there you go, sir. It says, Kevin James Pettiford said he went back and forth in his mind. That's what we talked about just before, about the justice and the jury did not believe that he was in a uh, manic mental state because of that statement. It says, he was arrested soon after, intentionally bashing Mr. Murray to death. The jury rejected. Yep, we know that. Just trying to see if there's anything else here. Uh huh. Apparently, the prosecution urged the court to reject a defense assertion. Pettiford had some form of bipolar disorder and was in a manic state at the time. They did, and that is good. He pointed to Pettiford having weighed up whether to commit the murder. Yes. The 38 year old was also, he also delayed attacking an inmate. Nathan Mellows on two occasions, one because he wanted to watch test cricket on television and the murder might interfere with that, and another because he wanted to watch a Star Wars movie. Apparently TV and movies very important to this guy. You may not get murdered if you have a great movie or sport on. You may be able to, you know, just delay it to another day. So yeah, I think that shows that he's full of crap. It says here, defense barrister Jason Watts said there were different degrees of manic episodes and Pettiford's presentation had been different since he started on his current regime of psychiatric medication. I, I don't know. You'd have to show us a psychiatric report. It says, Mr. Murray's daughter Kate told the court Pettiford had deprived her of a future with her father who had a wicked sense of humor and was often too smart for his own good. Um, she said, my father didn't get the chance to walk me down the aisle at my wedding 
all have a father-daughter dance that I've seen so many of my friends enjoy. He won't be here to see the birth of his first granddaughter. So it's very sad. <coughs> it said, Our family suffers from profound sorrow and anger from one choice, one evil choice, she said. Pettiford said he had the impulse to kill from a young age, telling police it got worse as he got older and he did not know why. He described himself as emotionless during the attack, striking Mr. Murray five or six times in the temple with three large rocks. He was at the wrong place at the wrong time. That was it, he told police. And uh, yeah, he has now been sentenced to 35 years behind bars. I think the, the police were probably right in trying to seek a life imprisonment. It's a shame that the... Uh, the judge did not give it, but maybe the judge sees that the fact that he'll be 70 by the time he may be released is a strong enough deterrent, possibly. Marilanda says the hand of death, yes. Have no plans except for with Ping. Why? What are we doing? Uh, Lisa says, ah, oh, your daughter's borrowing the car. She's always doing that. She's always taking your car. You're going to have to smack her like she's five. No, I'm just joking. Uh, Juicy Jewel says, what? what cost? What What does it cost to come to Australia or Canada from the USA? I don't know, probably like thousands for an air ticket. Probably thousands, my friend. <laughs> Same thing I do every weekend. I'm just trying to see if I've missed anything. Reby says, My cousin stabbed and killed two people and only got 10 years because he has a brain injury. His mother, my aunt, told the family he only was in jail for grievous bodily harm. Oh, they tried to soften the blow to the rest of the people they know? Fair enough, yeah. I could imagine. It's a... It's not a great icebreaker if you're like, yeah, our brother in jail for murder, no, like my, our cousin in jail for murder, he sent me a card the other day, a Christmas card. Yeah, it's not a not a great icebreaker, is it? The chat should be available, but sometimes it takes a few hours for it to pop back up. It, it, immediately after the show finishes, the replay, the chat goes away until after the video has processed and then it'll come back up so it can take anywhere from like an hour to like a day it just depends on youtube it's not up to me or it's whenever they do it all right you do that you do that you do that you say ping sent this to you <laughs> that would be funny uh all right Mr. Hand of Death, 35 years in jail. That is, here, look at him. Look how smug he looks when he was uh, arrested by police on a bus after murdering a man. He looks like he's like, couldn't give a, a damn in the world. He's like, yeah, arrest me. I'll be fine. Danny, or oh, Mr. Dan Yi says, I have a lot of cousins in prison, gangsters, Note, gangsters never plead insanity. No, they do their time and they don't snitch, do they, Danny? They never snitch. All right, let's keep going. You know, I was hoping today that we were going to have more information on uh, Sebastian, but there really isn't a lot. Uh, in um, In Elijah's case, the search has been suspended until, I think it's Wednesday, tomorrow. Then they're going to be back out searching for Elijah Vu again. I think the family just needed a break. I think they've been out almost every day. So they're having a little break for a minute. Hold on. Give me one second. I'll find the Elijah thing. One moment.
sorry <laughs> let me get it elijah there was an update aha uh -huh, here so it says elijah vu volunteer search re resumes on a wednesday sounds like they're just going to have a little bit of time off they have done this before they've had like two or three days off and then done another big um like search effort i think they just you know the family's probably tired it says here there are no volunteer searches efforts on monday or tuesday and then they're going to be back on wednesday and thursday after a meeting at manitowoc's uh, mikador theater and that is at 9 30 and 1 p.m there's another day of rest on friday and then search efforts will continue again on saturday there are no plans to search on easter sunday so there you go they're just having little breaks in between searching and that's totally understandable um volunteer because they're volunteers all volunteers they need a day of rest they can't search every day it's uh you know they need uh, some time off <laughs> hold on sorry i keep feeling like i have to cough and then i'm like no i don't yes i do uh yes so Nancy S says, it's not only yours, Ping, it's weird. I'll have a look into it. I, I can't tell you anything, but I'll have a look for you. All right. So there's, yeah, not a lot in Elijah, unfortunately. I hope they find that little boy. I really do. He, I think they're close to knowing where he is, especially after they found that blanket. I don't think he's too far away. I think they've just got to narrow that search zone. And when they do, they'll find him. They just got to get there. They just got to get there for the little kid. Um, there is a little bit on Corpus Christi. Hold on, Corpus. Mr. Caleb Harris. There's not a lot, but I can show you a little update from yesterday. We didn't really talk about it all right it's this one from w o a i yeah it says the ongoing investigation into the mysterious disappearance of caleb harris now they released some like cctv footage and i don't know if i showed it on this show hold on i probably should do that You sort of see him in a car park, like it's a doorbell surveillance footage. Aha, uh -huh, here we go. All right, it's from this video. Friday night into the urgent search for Caleb Harris. Tonight, we're reviewing new video of the Island University student appearing to be from the last night that he was seen. A ring camera capturing some of his last movements before his mysterious disappearance. So take a look here. Caleb can be seen in the parking lot at his off-campus apartment complex off of Ennis Jocelyn. Around 1 a.m., he was with one of his roommates, a friend outside playing with a dog. Caleb's face visible as he looked toward the ring camera before they make their way back in the other direction on that night in early March. And the search for Caleb Harris now in its third week. Just yesterday, it's and around 1 a.m. All right, let's let's have a look. It's not very clear, but at least this is what I would consider proof of life. And it's it shows you that it's, you know, what an hour, a couple of hours before he went missing, he is alive. He's with his roommates. We can see him on the video, and he looks like he's having a good time, like he's smiling, you know. He looks like he's having a good old time with the dog and his buddies. He doesn't look like he is distressed in any way. Doesn't look like he's having a bad day. So there's the dog. He picks up the dog. And then they all sort of like wander back inside. And that's uh that's it. But where is he? Where did he go? 
after after that, after ordering Uber Eats and a few uh, snack items for the next day, because he was going to go fishing again, so he always buys a certain type of, uh, what are they called? Lunchables, these Lunchable things. And he always buys them. That's what he eats when he goes fishing, apparently. And uh, he ordered those, and they were left on the doorstep, and in the morning, no Caleb Harris. He disappeared. Where is he? Don't know. Um, It says here, while the public isn't seeing evidence of foot searches, Collier says there is a team of detectives working on Harris's case every day, all day. The team meets each day and organizes when That is very odd, guys. I don't know if you guys heard that. Hold on. Let me just check something. Sorry to break the show. I I need to check this. There was a whole bunch of sirens that just stopped right outside my place. Oh, yeah, there is. Hold on. What the hell happened? Uh, On our emergency app, it is saying there's something there. Because, like, a whole bunch of sirens just stopped, like, right outside my window. Uh, I think it's someone's crashed their car, unfortunately. I hope it isn't uh, a pedestrian that got hit. That would be awful. Um, I'll keep an eye on it, but we'll keep going. Sorry about that. Uh, It says the team each, each and every day and organizes when credible tips are called in. The department's drone team is called in to help with those searches. At the same time, Kayla's father spent Monday searching for his son in a helicopter. The search yielded nothing, which Randy Harris says is a good thing. I guess it is. One of the most notable facts of this investigation is what Caleb did not have with him when he vanished. He apparently stepped outside without his keys and shoes. He only had his phone. Yeah, that that says to me that someone who was planning to just walk back in the door that they only came out for a couple of seconds, probably to grab the food. He probably didn't want to stay out there too long. It was probably like, I'm just waiting for my Uber Eats and I'm going to go inside, you know. I don't know what, guys, that's really bad. There is like, that's like the fifth vehicle to show up with lights on. Ah, oh, damn it. Ah, uh, guys, hold on one second. I need to check this. This is very strange. Sorry, ladies and gents. I'm just trying to see if... Okay. Mm, I can't see anything, which is very strange, but... Okay, sorry. All right, we can continue. Um, It says, Caleb is seen on a ring doorbell with his roommate, friend, and puppy at 1 a.m. At 2 a.m., roommate goes to sleep. Caleb is preparing his fishing reels for the next day. Like we said, he wanted to go fishing. This is the last time his roommate sees Caleb. At 2.44 a.m., Caleb sends a Snapchat walking the new dog. At 2.58 a.m., Caleb's phone is turned off or dies. It pings at his apartment complex. At 3.20 a.m., Uber driver seen on surveillance camera with Caleb's order. Notably, the footage could have one hour time swing. Caleb's Uber Eats order was still on his doorstep the next morning. It was a Red Bull energy drink and two Lunchables. Collier says investigators have knocked on doors and interviewed tenants at Caleb's off-campus apartment complex, as well as the complex adjacent to his along Ennis Jocelyn Drive. They've also requested surveillance footage, but couldn't reveal if any had been given into evidence. Detectives at this point have interviewed Caleb's roommates, friends, and family, and acquaintances. In its update last week, CCPD said, Detectives at this point have no reason to suspect any of these individuals had anything to do with Harris's disappearance. 
Apparently, they did a search of 30 vacant apartments, revealed no helpful details. The update also referenced help from the FBI and the United States Marshal Service, but Collier couldn't elaborate in what capacity those agencies were involved. Collier said the investigation has led the team to both uh, New Brunfels and San Antonio, but couldn't expand on why or who the detectives were interested in interviewing in those locations. So, a lot of people are saying they need to look into their roommates a lot more, but I feel like they probably were the first people the cops looked at. <laughs> I, apparently I am. I'm living in uh, South LA in the 80s, apparently. Well, what do they call the hood in Australia? They probably call it the hood or the ghetto or I don't know. Yeah, that was weird. I've I've never heard so many sirens outside. I think that was um a crash. I think someone's car crashed. Um, there's an intersection like right here, and I think that's what happened. I think someone has hit someone. See more sirens. Yeah, another another siren just pulled up. Whatever's going on, it's pretty bad. Good thing I don't have to go outside and walk a dog. That is true. <laughs> that is true. Um, oh, not that one. Marlon Corson says, is the dog still there? Yes, the dog is already there. Um, the dog is still at the apartment. I, you know, I wondered, they said it's a new dog. Maybe it's like one of those uh, those scams, but then why wouldn't they take the dog? You know how people, when they sell people a puppy and then they go back and rob the people and take the dog back and then they resell the dog again? But Reby says, we we all, we all call it the West. Yeah, the West. We have the West down here, but I don't live in the West. I actually live in a good area. It's just, I don't know what's going on. Uh, Red Like Wine Again says, I always think of that if I go to a hotel to evacuate for a hurricane, that I have to walk my dog. That's true. Red Like Wine says, Ping, do you live in a high crime neighborhood? No, I don't. I live in a very safe neighborhood. Uh, it's it's just it's actually going through a bit of a crime wave at the moment, but normally it's actually one of the safest um, suburbs in Melbourne. It's just going through a weird kind of a uh, thing at the moment. What kind of dog? Well, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Where is our article? And then I can here. Yeah, might they might have it on this video? Wait, no. Hold on. Uh, Caleb Harris. Let me see if I can find a photo of it. Caleb Harris. Dog. Let me see if there's a photo of him. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Well, there's him. There's a photo of him and like two dogs. One is like a little... Like a sausage dog, like Scrappy. And then one is like a... Something else. Hold on, let me see if I can show you this. I don't know if this is the dog. This is the new dog or this is an old dog. But you can sort of see it looks like Scrappy Joe. It's like a little brown Deutschhound or something. Can't actually see like what. Here's another photo of Caleb, by the way. You can tell he liked fishing. He had a fish hat. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever said what type of dog it is. Just that it is a dog. Yeah, I don't see anyone listing what what um what type of dog. Hmm. I'm trying to see if anyone on Twitter or Reddit has it.
No, I don't see anyone listing what type. Maybe someone in the chat knows. Guys, give me. Do you guys want me to go take a photo of this? Guys, let's all wait one minute. I'm going to go take a photo. I'm going to walk outside. I'm going to come back and we're going to see what this is. All these sirens, okay? Give me two, five, three minutes, okay? Go get a drink. I'm going to go take a photo. I'll be back. Hold on. All right, I'm back. I'm back. You guys all riveted. Um, I went out there and like all my neighbors are out there. I don't know if I can show you this somehow. After this, there's like ten cop cars out there. I don't know if I can show you. Oh, there's like all these fire brigades and like cop cars up there. Yeah, you guys can't really see, but there's like I don't know, like. A whole bunch of ambulances and cop cars and two fire engines and I have no idea what's going on. But um it looks pretty bad. It looks pretty bad. They've stopped all the traffic. It's pretty bad up there. Lisa, it's up on um yeah, it's up on Bay, up on Bay Road. <clears throat> Something bad is happening. Yeah, it looks like there's a whole they've stopped all the traffic as well. <clears throat> they stopped there like no one can drive through everything stopped um evil says howdy how i'm late how are you all good to see you we just had a weird uh i don't know everything happens outside of ping's house apparently <laughs> people people got uh, sirens and bad things who knows all right let's keep going sorry about that i just really wanted to check it out in case it was uh something serious like i had to leave or something because we don't normally have that many you know emergency uh services that close it's not it's not that normal to have like i don't know it's probably about eight trucks down there like on the corner so a bit weird all right let's keep going let's talk about we've talked about caleb let's talk about the little girl uh it's really really horrible and i but like, let's talk about it. All right, let's, let me find the link.
from Fox Business. No, not Fox Business. All right. Girl A drowns after being sucked into malfunction. I mean, we don't know. The, the body of the little girl who went missing at a hotel pool has been found wedged in very tight to a pool pipe believed to be faulty. A young girl has tragically died after being sucked into a malfunctioning pipe in a hotel pool. Aaliyah Jaiko 8, I hope I'm saying her name right, that's want to be respectful, vanished while swimming with her family at the Double Tree by Hilton in Texas over the weekend. She was found dead in the 30 centimeter wide pool tube. 13 hours later, the tragic disaster happened at the Houston Doubletree as Aaliyah swam with her family in the Lazy River-style pool on Saturday. The little girl was initially reported missing with search teams called in to try and locate the child, according to KTRK-TV. However, security footage of the pool later revealed that the child had gone underwater and never resurfaced. There's a photo of the cute little girl. How very sad. She likes swimming, you can tell, look. Um, Aaliyah's body was found after the pool was drained and a camera was sent into one of its pipes. They said, we put the pipe, we put them, we put them poles in there almost 20 feet and we saw her little hand and part of her body. So we got the fire department back out there. That was Tim Miller from Equisearch. Um, They got called in to help find her. It says... It appears right now that the pump was put in there and it was probably malfunctioning because of that open pipe that she ended up in was supposed to be pushing out water, not sucking in water. Um, This is the pipe right here. Look how large it is. I mean, that just looks dangerous, right? It's it's massive. Easily a little kid can um, can get stuck in there. And apparently she was so far back when they looked in there, they couldn't even see her. That's how far in there she was. It says, Mr. Miller said Aaliyah was found, was found her body was wedged in so very, very tight. He said, I I don't think she decided, I am going to swim in here and see what's here. Many of us had to wipe tears from our eyes. This is one of the saddest ones we've seen in a good while. According to the Harris County Institute of Forensic Science, the girl's preliminary cause of death was drowning and mechanical asphyxia and appeared to be an accident according to the mail online there's a photo of her and her mom what a cute little girl it says Aaliyah's devastated mother daniella has since shared a heartbreaking selfie taken at the pool on facebook and captioned it our last photo she says they say we all have our destiny marked but i can't understand why yours was like this she wrote in spanish on facebook and said, thank you, my love, it for the eight years you gave me by your side. Thank you, my girl, for teaching me what love is and a noble heart. How terrible. Let me show you. I had an interview with uh, Tim Miller, if I can find it. There's some photos of her. I'm trying to find the Tim Miller interview. Okay, let me see if I can find the interview with Mr. Tim Miller. Might be this one. Okay. Well, many questions. After an eight-year-old girl dies when she was sucked into a pipe inside of a pool at a hotel over the weekend. It happened Saturday evening at the Doubletree Hotel in Northwest Houston. That's where we find Fox 26's Jade Flory. Jade, what do we know at this point? Well, Houston police are still waiting for the autopsy results for eight-year-old Aaliyah Hako. It's still unclear what exactly caused her death, but search and rescue experts that I spoke with today believe it may have been a mechanical pump malfunction. This is something we never thought that we'd see. What started as a normal day at the pool became a desperate search for an eight-year-old girl who disappeared on Saturday. Investigators say the girl was swimming with family in a Lazy River-style pool at the Doubletree Hotel. Officials reviewed security footage and say it shows the little girl going under the water, but never coming up. We never see her get out of the pool. 
The Texas EquiSearch team was called to assist with the search. Hours later, using long poles with cameras attached to the ends, searchers found the girl inside of a large pipe in the pool. The size of her body, I, it would have been nearly impossible for her to intentionally swim in that pipe. Because when I say she was lodged in there tight, she was lodged in there tight. The eight-year-old girl, Aaliyah Lanayeko, her family says she was an energetic little girl who loved swimming, animals, and being outdoors. They say she was a kind girl who touched the hearts of those who met her. To even imagine that her body could get in a pipe that size, something had to go terribly wrong. Investigators are still at work, but they are working some theories. Something went wrong in the suction was actually pushing out. What was pushing out was actually sucking it in. Now, we did reach out to the Double Tree by Hilton about the incident, and they say that this Double Tree Brook Hollow location is independently owned and operated, so they cannot comment on the hotel's behalf. In the meantime, the pool is closed until further notice. Reporting from Northwest Houston, Jade Flurry, Fox 26 News. I wonder if Tim Miller ever gets tired of seeing dead children. I. I know he does it. <clears throat> I know he does it to help families, but and I know he does it because of his own experience. But man, he must he must get so sick of it. But I guess he maybe sees the uh, <clears throat> the silver lining that he's bringing them home to their family. Hold on, I got a bit crackly. Hold on. All right, there we go. Uh, Danny Mitchell says, I do. I'm sorry about that. I think we all wish that children would just come home and not be, you know, killed like in these horrible, brutal, you know. Who would ever think going swimming in a Hilton pool would mean that your child ends up like that? I mean, I, I, it's not something you can foresee at all. All right, let's go to our next story. If I can find it. Uh, yes, uh, Illinois. Are we going to head to Illinois? I think we are, if I can find it. Uh, da, da, da. Yes. So we're going to have to go. <clears throat> what is wrong with my voice today? All right. I think it was all that running I did. Obviously, I'm so unfit. That's better. All right. It says here. Oh, can we go bigger? Yes. There we go. No, that's not it. All right, fine, we'll have to use this link. It says, a Missouri man will spend the rest of his days behind bars murdering a young teen before stuffing her in a suitcase and discarding her at a wildlife preserve. According to the Illinois State Police, 35-year-old James A. Merritt received a life sentence earlier this month for second-degree murder. He was also given 20 years for armed criminal action, four years for tampering with physical evidence, and five years for trafficking for sexual exploitation. Additionally, he was fined $25,000. The sentencing stems from the discovery in Pulaski County in March 2020, identified as Haley Decker, 18, from Normal, Illinois. Investigators said she was found in Cypress Creek National Wildlife Refuge, stuffed inside a suitcase. Lauren Crime reports that the discovery occurred when a man walked with his child, noticed blonde hair protruding from luggage. Uh, law enforcement determined that the victim had sustained multiple blunt force trauma injuries to the head. Investigators cross-referenced recent missing persons reports, which helped identify the victim. Cell phone evidence linked the victim to merit. 
There's a photo of James Merritt there. It says, further investigations reveal that Decker had once lived with Merritt and had been a sex worker at the time of her death. Merritt subsequently confessed during a police interview, admitting to meeting Decker online and setting her up with men to have sex for money. Phone records indicate that Merritt and Decker were together on January 25th, 2020, before traveling to the wildlife refuge where Decker's body was found. Blood was later discovered in Merritt's residence, and his vehicle showed signs that he tried to clean up the blood. Uh, jurors only deliberated for 90 minutes, unanimously finding Merritt guilty of all charges. The trial, initially held in Pemiscot County, was moved to New Madrid County, where prosecuting attorney Andrew Lawson said he was happy with the verdict. He said, I'm extremely pleased with the, ver the jury's verdict in this case. He said, without the tireless effort of multiple law enforcement agencies, this verdict would not have been possible. Thanks to the outstanding cooperation between the Missouri State Highway Patrol, the New Madrid County Sheriff's Department, and the Illinois State Police, the defendant was arrested within three weeks of the victim's body being discovered. Decker's aunt, Sherry, told the Daily Beast that Decker was a sweet girl with an unfortunate life that her family tried to keep her from. I, I want to know more about the, uh, the young woman. Hold on. Hold on, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to see more about, about her. Haley Decker from Normal, Illinois. Okay. Apparently, we only have like one video that we can watch. Okay. New this morning, a Morehouse man is sentenced to life in prison after being convicted in the murder of an Illinois teenager. 35-year-old James Merritt also sentenced to another 29 years in prison for other charges stemming from a body that was found in rural Pulaski County, Illinois in March of 2020. The body of 18-year-old Haley Decker of Normal, Illinois was discovered inside a suitcase that was located in the Cypress Creek National Wildlife Refuge. Decker was from Normal, but frequented the Sykeson area. A New Madrid County, Missouri jury convicted Merritt of second degree murder and other charges back in January of this year. The top of the morning. Nope, no top of the morning. We don't care about that. Um, that's a shame that for such a big trial and murder of an 18-year-old girl, that's like the only video I could find. Let me see. Maybe that's under the murderer's name, which is not how we should do things. Hold on. Hmm. Just trying to see if there's any... No, okay. Um, but Law and Crime... No, that's Richard Merritt. That's not the same guy. I don't know. This is very strange. I don't know if Google's being stupid t towards me again or... Yeah, from WSILTV.com. 35-year-old sentence for murder after body found in Southern Illinois in 2020. It says a 35-year-old man was sentenced to dozens of years in jail in relation to a death investigation from 2020 when a body was found in Pulaski County. The sentencing is in relation to a body found in Pulaski County in March of 2020 where Haley Decker, 18, of Normal, Illinois, was found in the Cypress Creek National Wildlife Refuge. The investigative efforts, yep, yeah, there's a photo of her. That's what I wanted. I wanted a photo of her to show you. Finally, that was uh, Haley Decker. She is the uh, victim in this case, unfortunately. Decker was uh, reported missing on March 4, 2020. Fingerprints were taken after the body was found in Pulaski County, and which confirmed the identity of Decker. On January 26, 2024, Merritt was found guilty on all charges in a courtroom in New Madrid County. 
So there you go, there's her photo, finally. <laughs> you guys are so funny. All right, so that's that update. Very sad. So many dead women. That's I feel like 80% of our show is like, let me read you the list of names today of dead women. Um, here's our daily update of murdered females. Just like the the ratio of murdered women to murdered men is so lob lopsided. It's not even funny. It's just like that's like eighty percent of our content is uh, this woman died and this little girl died and this lady died. This lady was found on the side of the road. This one was stuffed into a box. This one was killed in a domestic violence incident. It's like every day. It's a it's it really is a uh epidemic it really is uh let's find you something else do you guys want to see about a giant snake i can show you something about a giant snake apparently a wildlife photographer was um a few weeks ago did a movie with like a what well, like a documentary on a uh giant amazonian snake i'll show you this giant snake he actually swam with it look he actually swims with the snake and he was like this is the largest snake ever or whatever 440 pound snake it was huge look at it there it is this giant snake he said it was like the largest one he'd ever seen and then a week later hunters killed the snake they killed it on the banks of the Amazon. And they uh, just killed it for no reason. Because it was big. Because it was large. They decided to kill it. Never hurt anyone. It just lived in the river. Enjoyed swimming. There you go. You can see the dude swimming with it. There you go. Look. It looks like a, sw a swimming rock. There you go. Look how giant that thing is. It looks like a giant sea serpent. This is probably where they get mythical tales of sea serpents from, from those kind of snakes. And look, it had no qualms. It didn't want to hurt that guy. Not at all. There you go. So, but apparently hunters have killed the snake. Um, no reason why. They just have... It's very, what a shame that that snake's like 50 years old, apparently. Um, okay. Let me grab you our next story. We've got a long show tonight, a late show tonight, because there is no cap on our uh, time frame tonight. So we've got a whole bunch of things to, to uh, catch up on. It says, young child helps 13-year-old girl escape registered sex offender from home in Allen Park. They helped each other escape. Let's listen. We are learning new details about the man accused in two brutal sexual assaults. Michael Holcomb was before a judge today charged with raping a 13-year-old girl in Allen Park. The same day, police say he raped two elderly sisters in Dearborn. And now we are learning another child in the home when Michael Holcomb allegedly attacked the teen, a little girl who helped her escape. Seven Action News reporter Kimberly Craig has the new revelations. Michael Holcomb spent eight years in prison for the sexual assault of a child in Dearborn Heights. Now police here in Allen Park say this registered sex offender has done it again. Mr. Holcomb, can you state your name, please? Of Michael Holcomb. 52-year-old Michael Sean Holcomb charged with six counts of first-degree criminal sexual conduct, multiple counts of third-degree CSC, as well as unlawful imprisonment and assault by strangulation. And Allen Park police say the victim is a 13-year-old girl. He's a monster. There's no other way to put it. He's an evil monster. This woman will call Sandy does not want to be identified, but she's known Michael Holcomb for years, and she also knows the 13-year-old victim. It's absolutely heartbreaking. I think as the facts of this case come out, um, I think it will shock the conscience. Um, 
And, you know, it's one of those things that you hate to see um, for anybody's sake. Just last week, Michael Holcomb appeared in Dearborn's district court to be arraigned on multiple charges, including rape and torture for what he's accused of doing to two elderly women. Just a couple hours after he allegedly attacked the 13 year old girl in the home of one of his close relatives in Allen Park. I do feel if we wouldn't have got the suspect in custody, there could have been other victims. And there is another victim in Michael Holcomb's past. In 2010, in Dearborn Heights, he sexually assaulted another child. He went to prison for eight years and came out a registered sex offender. And then last week, when he was at the home of a relative, he attacked a 13-year-old who was visiting. Sandy said another child in the home saw what was happening. They helped each other escape. He tried to lock them both in the house and she's only seven years old. Sadly, she says that relative whose home it happened in was fully aware of Holcomb's previous sexual assault on another child. It's so negligent. It's so irresponsible. Holcomb was already being held without Bond in Dearborn's case, but Bond had to be set in Allen Parks. Here's his defense attorney who also represented him in 2010. We're not really making an argument with respect to whether or not he should go. Uh, just for the record, uh, want the court to understand that uh, I don't believe he'd go anywhere, nor do I believe that uh, he would again be a risk to the community. The judge not taking any chance and also ordered Holcomb to be held without bond. I think he's exactly where he needs to be, shackled away from the rest of the world so he can no longer hurt anyone. In Allen Park, Kimberly Craig, 7 Action News. Like, what do we got to do to get these monsters to go away? I mean, a 13-year-old girl. Not only a 13-year-old girl, but two elderly women. Like, this guy doesn't have a range. It's not like he's like, oh, I'm into little kids and I abuse little kids or I, I sexually assault adults. He just whatever. It's like, oh, old lady, sure. Young girl, sure. Teenager, sure. 25-year-old, sure. It's like, he doesn't care. It's like, whatever whatever has a lady parts, I'm, I'm good. I'm going for it. This guy is literally animalistic. There is no way to put it. It's just like he sees, you know, female and attack. Like, there is no thinking. It's just, this guy is just pure evil. Holcomb 52 was arraigned Tuesday on new charges stemming from his alleged attack on a 13-year-old girl last week on Sunday. The, th the woman who asked that we not use her real name or show her face said it's outrageous that anyone would allow Hulk Holcomb, a registered sex offender, to be alone with any child. Right. Doesn't matter that he, he uh, like sexually assaulted elderly women. It doesn't matter. It should it should be an indicator that this guy should be in a cage at every possible time. In 2010, Holcomb was charged with first and second degree criminal sexual assault, as well as unlawful imprisonment for his crimes against children against a child in Dearborn Heights. He pleaded guilty to second degree criminal sexual conduct, and after serving eight years in prison, he was paroled in April 2018 and discharged from parole two years later in 2020. So it only took him like four years to go again. I mean, he was like, oh, you know, I really miss jail. And, you know, there's there's so many great young little girls around here. Let's, let's go again. Let's do it again. It says the attack on the teen who was visiting took place in the home of one of Holcomb's close relatives who was aware of his past. Yeah, that's great. Bring a young girl to your home and be like, I'm going to go to the shop. You two just hang out for 20 minutes. Uh, Sandy, who knows the 13-year-old victim and her family, said there was another child in the home who woke up and saw the assault in progress. They helped each other escape, she said. He tried to lock them both in the house, and she's only seven years old. The girls ran to a neighbor who called 911. That's just frightening. In that case, Holcomb is charged with six counts of first-degree criminal sexual conduct, six counts of third-degree criminal sexual conduct, one count of unlawful imprisonment, and one count of assault with intent to do great bodily harm by strangulation, and one count of fourth-degree criminal, criminal sexual conduct. 
So he tried to strangle strangle her. I mean, this guy is a danger to anyone and everyone. Just keep him locked up forever. The Sandy told Seven Action News, it's absolutely heartbreaking. There's really no other way to put it. It's just heartbreaking. It's so terrible. Police said Holcomb fled the scene in Allen Park before officers arrived. And just two hours later, he allegedly made his way into the home of two elderly sisters in Dearborn, where police and prosecutors said he brutally R-worded them, assaulted them, and tortured the two. One woman was able to escape and run to a neighbor's house where 911 was called. Dearborn police said Holcomb fled that scene, but later the same day, he was tracked down to a nearby hotel. I mean, let's see what this has to say here. Relatives of the two elderly victims did not want to talk, but they came to court today to see the man accused of heinous crimes against them, including rape and torture. This is a felony charge for which the maximum penalty is life or any term of years to understand the nature of count one. Yes. 52-year-old Michael Sean Holcomb is now charged in the brutal attack of two women in their home in Dearborn Sunday afternoon. And after the judge read the charges that include multiple counts of first-degree criminal sexual conduct and torture, prosecutors asked that Holcomb be held without bond. Mr. Holcomb is a danger to the community. He's preying on our most vulnerable victims. And I just don't see any society that would be safe with him in their community. And more charges could be around the corner for Holcomb because just two hours before he allegedly beat and raped the two senior citizens in Dearborn, he was accused of sexually assaulting a teenage girl in Allen Park who was visiting one of his relatives. Holcomb was arrested at a motel after his alleged monstrous attack on the two sisters, ages 78 and 85. Our victims were brutally beaten. Our victims were brutally assaulted. Our victims were brutally raped and our victims were brutally tortured. One of them was not even mobile. Both our elderly victims remain hospitalized at this moment and both are thankfully in stable condition. And Michael Sean Holcomb is no stranger to crime. He served eight years in prison after pleading guilty in Wayne County in 2010 to second degree criminal sexual conduct. It was a case out of Dearborn Heights and it's what landed Holcomb in Michigan Sex Offender Registry where he lists his address at this house in Ecorse. But if convicted in this new case, he may spend the rest of his life behind bars. The level of brutality in this case is really unimaginable. This is a terrible crime. In my 26 years, this is one of the most heinous things that I've seen and witnessed. Um, and again, I, I continue to pray for the victims and their families. In Dearborn, Kimberly. Hey guys, we're going to change uh, subjects for a second. Someone sent me this. Let me uh, refresh this indicate some heavier rain and yes Hold snow on. in there what is too. going on apparently there is an officer involved shooting occurred after a man entered a full fullerton bank and claimed to have an explosive device police say officers responded to the 100 block of west uh bastantry road just after 5 p.m tuesday after reports of a possible bank robbery when officers arrived they began to evacuate employees from the bank while inside the bank, witnesses stated the suspect produced what appeared to be an explosive device. Upon exiting the bank, an officer involved shooting occurred. It's unclear if the suspect was shot and if they remain holed up inside. No employees were injured in the incident. The investigation is ongoing. Anybody have an update on this? Whether this is actually... Someone just PM'd it to me but didn't give me any details. I'm trying to have a quick look if this is actually something that's ongoing or it's finished. I'm just having a quick look. Uh, yeah, I don't really... So Raw Reporting had it as police shot a man outside of Wells Fargo in Fullerton after he claimed to have an explosive device during a possible bank robbery on Tuesday. The incident occurred around 5.10 p.m. Yeah, uh, On West Bastentury Road, according to Fullerton Police, the suspect showed what seemed to be an explosive device inside the bank. But if this was something that was so 
high profile, they wouldn't be showing the weather on um on here. They wouldn't be showing the seven day forecast. They they'd literally have a live view of of the bank, especially in LA. In LA, they would definitely have it. Past banking hours. That's true. It's late at night. Peekaboo says that last one we spoke about, not the bank robbery, the other one, is really close to me, about 30 minutes. Hey, Alicia, how are you? Good to see you. Yeah, I think it's dead. I don't think, um, I don't think they're actually doing anything live on this. Commercial bank, okay. That's very sad. Check this out. I know this was one that I was following the other day. The Los Angeles County Medical Examiner's Office released new information in the death of Manual Arts High School student Shaylee Major. The agency ruled Shaylee's death accidental and the cause as sequential, uh, sequen sequenlay of blunt head trauma. So sequential hits of blood of blunt false trauma to the head. The report is not yet finalized. Shaley's mother, Maria, believes her 16-year-old daughter died as a result of injuries inflicted on Shaley by another student during a physical altercation at the school. Los Angeles police tell Eyewitness News detectives responded to an incident where the victim fell down a flight of stairs. Okay. However, her mother says her daughter did not fall down any stairs, instead fainted as a result of injuries days prior. So this sounds like it could be a bullying incident. Let's see. Because of injuries inflicted on... The medical examiner's office has released new information in the death of Manual Arts High School student Shaley, Shaley Mejia. Mejia's mother believes her 16-year-old daughter died because of injuries inflicted on her by another student during a fight at school. The medical examiner's office ruled her death accidental and the cause as sequelae of blunt head trauma. LAPD told Eyewitness News detectives responded to an incident in which the victim fell down a flight of stairs. However, Mejia's mother argues her daughter did not fall down any stairs and instead fainted because of injuries she had suffered days prior. That report not yet finalized. Yeah, it sort of sounds like a bullying incident, like maybe she'd been getting hit from, like someone had been beating her up at school, possibly. Lindy, there was a dead body lying outside for a while. Oh, they, they killed the guy? Okay. Fair enough. Um, okay. Let me see if I have anything else. We're almost at the two hour mark. That's pretty good. We normally uh, finish at the one hour and 20 minute mark for the live show each night. So we've gone an extra 40 minutes. It's not bad. I'm just trying to see if I have anything else on my list. I thought I did. Let me see. Nope, that's not it. I'm just trying to see if I can find any. Uh, let me check my links. I know people send me a couple of things. We know that one, the missing Amber Alert. That was uh, completed yesterday. That was a woman that was missing in San Diego, but she was found. Thank God. I'll have a quick look on, on here. Nope. Uh, we still just have the two, the two guys, Sebastian Rogers and Elijah Vu, right now. Um, you know, there's been no update. Do you remember I brought you you a story a week or two ago about a girl who was found strangled and beaten under a bridge in um in Texas? They. I still do not have a murder charge for that. I don't have a murder charge for that at all. I'm going to search it again right now. 
remember she went for a late night walk and uh somehow the neighbor came back but no one else did and they found her under a bridge with no clothes on and had been strangu strangulated i'm just trying to see If there's any update on her. No. There's no no update. No murder charge. Nothing. It's so weird. Because they reckon they detained someone. Let me check KTSA. No. No no update on KTSA either about that. Um, I'm just trying to see if there's anything else. What's really strange is a lot of the links that I had for, for her as well are gone. Which is even even weirder. That had her full name in it. Seventeen year old girl's body was found in a ditch under a bridge after her parents reported her missing. San Antonio police said she had gone for a walk with her neighbor the night of March twelfth, according to KTS. K-S-A-T, the neighbor returned a few hours later without her, and then they found her, police found the girl's phone and jacket before locating her naked body, the teen's body showed signs of trauma when they found her in a drainage ditch under a bridge, she was pronounced dead at the scene, the neighbor she was with was detained according to KTSA, however, however police are searching for another person of interest, which they ended up detaining that person as well. Just want to see if there's. Can't believe that. Two weeks, no update, no murder charge. That's very strange. Let's see. Every time I click a link, it says the link's gone, the link's dead. Here, Caitlin Elizabeth Hernandez. Last update was from my San Antonio eight days ago and they're still asking for um see sapd has offered a reward for any tips that lead to an arrest what they didn't they arre they arrested a second person that's very odd it says family members of a 17 year old girl caitlin elizabeth hernandez seek answers and justice after she was found dead in a ditch on the city's northeast side on tuesday march 12th Officials said Hernandez went for a walk with a neighbor but didn't return. Police later found her naked and dead in a ditch nearby. Here's what we know so far one week later. Okay, we want to know more about who was arrested. So, nothing. Who is the man she walked with? The neighbor who walked with Hernandez has not been identified. Police said they questioned and interviewed the neighbor, but it's unclear whether he will face charges. SAPD released photos of a person of interest on Wednesday. The person has been cooperating with detectives, according to the SAPD. It's also unclear if the person of interest will face any charges. No arrests have been made since Monday, March 18th. And there's been no updates at all. It's very, very odd. And this is from the Bayard County Medical Examiner's Office. Identified the 17-year-old girl in the ditch as Caitlin. That's a photo of her. But there's been no, no updates. Yeah. Thanks, DJ. I know you're from near the area. I haven't heard anything new. I keep checking every couple of days, but I never anything notice anything. Karen Reed court case coming up, and yeah, Chad is his um, first or whatever it is, first week in April. Um, I 
All right, I think that's almost about it. I don't really have anything else unless I missed somebody's, um, somebody sent something in. I'm just having a quick look. I don't want people to feel like they're not being heard. No, I think I got just about everything. Um, I don't know. I think that's going to be it for tonight. I don't know if we're going to come back for a late show because there's no need to. Because Trish is not here. There's no need to. I think we can just wrap up. We've done over two hours, two hours and four minutes. We've done a quite a long late, uh, quite a long nightly show tonight, over two hours. But um, normally we'd do a late show, but we're not getting our show cut in half this time. Uh, I do want to do more on the the forensic information that we were talking about last night, but we might do it later in the week. We were talking about the uh, the like the garbage tip being searched for our remains, and there was more information on how they do that. And I might do that another day on the late show because it's really interesting. And they actually, uh, in some of the documentation further down that we were reading, they actually do it in like different like shapes into the ground and that's how they do it because that's how they fill it they fill it on these different kind of angles and then they cover it with soil every day and it's uh quite quite interesting so they have to uncover all that to try and find those two girls there's no no update on sebastian no there's nothing as far as i know there's nothing yeah just everyone's talking about the uh, interview with Nancy Grace. Everyone's dissecting all that information and coming up with different things. But it just says, mother of missing teenager says he may have been abducted. But no, that Nancy Grace asked her, what is your theory? And her theory she came up with was that someone may have him. So there was, I did see something that uh, Seth Rogers said the his ex-wife and Chris Proudfoot or whatever, they won't talk to him anymore, something like that. Apparently they, they won't communicate with him, which is pretty poor. Yeah, well, I can show you. So Sebastian Rogers searched, Dad says Mom's stepdad won't talk to him. So they're having communication issues with a missing child. That's great. That's just great. Um, let's see what this says. It won't play. News Nation is now geo-blocking. Great. So apparently I can't play News Nation anymore. That's weird. Yeah. I'm going to have to get a VPN. This has been happening for like the last two weeks. All the news companies in America have turned on geo-blocking when for years they didn't have it. For years you could just uh, watch it out of uh, out of the country. Like we watched stuff on News Nation just a week ago. We were looking at that, that woman who is missing in Spain and we watched videos on here. It's very interesting. Um... It says, Seth Rogers is desperate to know the whereabouts of his 15-year-old son, Sebastian Rogers, who has been missing for a month. The Tennessee teen was reported missing on February 26th from uh, Sumner County. Yep, we know that. Seth told News Nation that neither Katie nor Chris have spoken with him about the investigation. I haven't spoken to them for about two weeks. They're not talking to me. Their, their name is not Brownford, is it? It's Proudfoot, right? They've got to hear Katie nor Chris Brownfoot. Their name is Proudfoot, isn't it? Or is it... Am I going crazy? Their name is Proudfoot, right? Yeah, Christopher Proudfoot. I wonder why they've got it listed as Brown Brownfoot. That's, in, that's a typo, maybe. It says, Volunteers with the United Cajun Navy who helped search for University of Missouri student Riley Strain have redirected some of their crews to help find Sebastian. Um, there's some sort of weird fight over this, too, 
last night on Nancy Grace, Nancy Grace quoted the wrong website for the United Cajun Navy. And then today there was some sort of online battle between United Cajun Relief and United Cajun Navy. And they're fighting over who's the original and who's the real one. And we're the original Cajun Navy and you're the imposter. And no, no, we're the real Cajun Navy and you're the fake one. And uh, it's tiring. Uh, it says the United Cajun Navy volunteers couldn't elaborate on exactly where they were sending search crews Sunday. However, members told News Nation affiliate WKRN they had drones and canines assisting. Let me check WKRN and see if they have an update because they're normally... Nah, they don't have anything new on Sebastian. Just a timeline of Rogers, Sebastian Rogers' disappearance. Um... This is interesting, though. Spring Hill fake bomb threat leads to swatting call investigation. There was, a, there was a fake bomb threat in Tennessee. Spring Hill police are actively investigating a bomb scare that forced the evacuation of hundreds of people at a weekend boxing event. Police are now investigating the hoax as a swatting incident. Swatting, yeah, swatting is a no deliberate crank call that lures law enforcement to a location for potentially nefarious purposes. News 2 obtained the 911 call from the incident Saturday night around 6.10 p.m. It says, I'm going to kill people, the caller said. The caller told 911 operator the pipe bombs were inside Building 500 at the Northfield Lane facility, which is the old Saturn HQ building near the GM plant. It's here where police said more than 500 boxing fans had gathered. 911, three in duffel bags. Caller, yes, three pipe bombs inside of duffel bags. All right, we have to watch the video on this. Hold on. Hill police are actively investigating a bomb scare that forced the evacuation of hundreds of people at a weekend event. Let's go to Andy Cordani. He's been investigating this case and joins us with the latest. Andy. Hey there, Mark. You know, police are now investigating this hoax as a swatting incident. Now, that's a deliberate crank call that lures law enforcement to a location for potentially nefarious purposes. I'm going to kill people. Saturday night. I have two five bombs inside of duffel bags. 6.10 p.m. A bomb threat is called in at this building where more than 500 boxing fans have gathered. Three in duffel bags. Yes. The 911 call indicates there's a pipe bomb and a firearm inside this venue. We got something going on over here right now. I mean, we're going to find them and stop it. No, no. Thinking the call is real? It's 20 minutes ago. No, I'm going to explode them in for the 20 minutes. Officers leave active calls around the city. The danger brings EMS and fire trucks as well as the Spring Hill tactical team. So we're trying to move the crowd. It soon learned that the call is fake. Everybody's got to go that way, guys. A swatting call made from a number used in other similar swatting calls. I'm not going to tell you the case of the bombs. From California to Nevada to Iowa to New Jersey to Florida. we got to get that crowd away from more bombs. Going up. It sounded authentic, so we want to make sure we responded to this call appropriately. Officers will search the 350,000 square foot facility while keeping 650 people outside. You guys are treating this like the real McCoy because that's what you think it could be. I mean, anytime we get a call of this nature, that's we're going to respond and we're going to handle it just like we would a bomb threat. A suspicious bag is located, x-rayed, and found to be nothing. But of course, the officers got to do their due diligence and they got to go in there and make sure the people that are inside that building are safe. By this time, more than three hours have transpired. An event has been disrupted and a lot of manpower is used on a threat that turns out to be a false call. Swatting is a form of domestic terrorism. That's exactly what it could be. Luckily, in this event, everybody is cool, calm and collective. Officers were able to search the area, deem it safe for everybody to go back in. And it turned out for the better. But there's plenty of events throughout the nation that that's not the case. Now I'm told that Spring Hill police have an active investigation. So far, that phone number comes back to a landline in Kansas. But figuring, figuring out who made that call, well, that's going to be certainly challenging. Let's end it back.
you know, they say it's going to be challenging, but there has been arrests on uh, swatting calls. There was one that was done on a popular YouTuber years ago, and they actually found two of the guys who did the swatting call, and they were arrested. And, um, yeah, they, they, people have been charged over it. In Australia, people have been charged over it and sent to prison. So it's really not a smart idea, uh, really not a clever idea to do at all. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. So, uh, Rebe, ping, I have a paid up VPN account I don't use anymore. I can share the details with you. Yeah, that would be very kind. That would make it easier. It only started in the last couple of weeks. Before that, we could always use the uh, overseas news sites. But recently, in the last one or two weeks, they've all started to be geo blocked. Something has changed. Uh, I mean, I've been doing this for uh, years. And I've never had a problem, and it's a recent, recent thing. Um, DJ says two porn sites have pulled out of Texas because of uncertainty of a new law about IDs for age. Probably going to be a lot of VPNs. Oh, yeah, probably. Also, today in Florida, there was a new law enacted that anyone under the age of 13 cannot have a social media account, and anyone 14 and 15 has to have parental consent. And that was a DeSantos thing. Apparently, I don't know how that's ever going to work. Kids will just tick the box that says, yes, I'm 14. Uh, I mean, that's yeah, that's what they've, they've always had, those little tick boxes where like, yes, I'm 18. Yes, I'm over 16. Yes, I'm over 12. Like, yeah, it's just going to lead to uh, developers to have to add a new checkbox on the login. That's it. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting that they they uh, made everyone evacuate from a 500 people at boxing event. Probably someone involved in the boxing event for sure. Someone who was going to lose a lot of money if um, if the event went went ahead. I'm guessing that's probably what it was. Um, yeah, I will let you know if they have any more information about that. Wow. It says a dangerous situation led to EMS and fire, fire trucks arriving as well as as well. And video shows the Spring Hill SWAT team gearing up with AR-15s preparing to go in. Officers met with organizers of the event who indicated they had fights interrupted before swatting calls. Uh, they had they have had fights interrupted before by swatting calls. So this is an issue they have dealt with in the past. SHPD investigated the number and told News 2 it's the same number that has been used to cause similar disturbances in other states from California to Nevada to New Jersey to Iowa. Believing the call was fake, SHPD still evacuated the building and searched the 350,000 square foot building out of an abundance of caution. The guy on the phone sounded like a teenager. He was like, yeah man, I'm totally going to blow them up. I've got the bombs. Yeah, in 20 minutes. 20, yeah, no, not not 20 minutes ago. 20 minutes. I'm totally going to blow them up. You didn't sound very serious. Of a, I mean, you have to take it seriously, but didn't sound very serious. Um, become like Singapore and you will have more law-abiding people. Yeah, where you'll get the cane for dropping rubbish. They do. They... Uh, serious serious uh penalties for just like littering that will get you for everything over there all right let me tidy up my links i think we're going to wrap up i think it's been long enough i think i think we've bored enough people for the night um yes you guys will have me all week though all over the weekend and tomorrow night there is no trish show tomorrow night either so you'll have me again just me tomorrow night. Um, we didn't. We haven't covered much of the uh, the Puff Daddy or P Diddy or whatever his name is because there's like 30 other channels that are covering it. I don't think you need me to rehash the same details over and over again. So I've kind of left it. Same reason I didn't do much on the uh, 
the bridge because I know there was uh, YouTubers on for like nine hours doing the same, you know, paragraph of information about the bridge and showing the same footage of the bridge falling down for like nine hours. So I, I don't want to do that. I'd rather keep at least bringing you guys different things to keep you entertained rather than just rehashing the same details over and over. Um, yes, I think that's okay. There was actually a uh, new story about the Dream World, uh, Dream World Thunder River Rapids ride. If you don't know what this is, back in, um, when was it? 2016, October 25th, 2016, four people were killed on a River Rapids ride in Queensland, Australia, when two rafts collided and one of them flipped over onto the conveyor belt. Uh, the victims had catastrophic injuries. I mean, the word they used was not compatible with life. That's how extensive the injuries were. W workers, and here's a photo of what it looked like. You can see the black cloth over one of them. Th there was, you know, and there's that conveyor belt. This was all filled with water under here normally. When, when this actually happened, they've drained all the water out, but this was full of water. And, um, yeah, there was all people here waiting for the ride, and a lot of people saw it, children saw it, and uh, they lost a, a bunch of people that day. But there was a guy, apparently one of the managers of the, the park and the ride, actually developed a, he left the company, and he developed a sort of support business that has to do with parrots sort of like a therapy business where you go and you can pat the parrots and talk to the parrots and you know work through your problems and stuff like that it says a loving uncle who saved his 12 year old niece's life in the dream world raft disaster only to lose his own has been awarded a bravery medal cameraman luke dorset was among 89 people recognized in tuesday's australian bravery decorations announced by the governor general david hurley um mr dorset immediately immediately placed his arm across his knees to prevent her from falling from the raft sadly however mr dorset fell from the raft himself and tragically died at the scene after becoming caught in the ride yeah he he got caught in the conveyor belt and uh, died due to his extensive injuries. But it's very nice that um, they've awarded him a bravery medal for saving his relative's life, young relative. She was actually thrown from the raft onto a uh, onto the walkway, I think, and she survived. You know, by the grace of God, somehow she survived. I think because she was so little and light that she was able to. Uh, you know, get flung from the ride and it saved her life very luckily. I should do a this day in history or like a this day in true crime history. That might be fun. We could look up uh, cases that happened on that day. Yeah, that would be interesting. All right. Yep. Yeah. We've done almost two and a half hours. Yeah. What time is it now? It's midnight, right? No. 11.30, 30. 11 yeah, I'll look into the uh, day in true crime thing. We might do that tomorrow night. And uh, yeah, that's it for tonight. There is no late show tonight. There will probably not be one tomorrow either. Due to Trish being away, we're doing a much longer show. Like tonight was two and a half hours. Tomorrow will probably be about two and a half hours as well. That is almost like having our normal show and the late show combined in one so it's been a it's been a long show um let me just check the thing before we go i haven't checked it in a couple of days okay that's fine um yes it is a long time to talk i do need a co-host maybe um well we don't normally do this long we don't normally do two and a half hours but anyways that's it. I'm going to go. Have a great night. Come back here tomorrow. And if you're on part of the replay crew, say hi. 
if you still have a town that we that you haven't commented yet in the comments leave a comment of your town our state and town and country that you would like to see represented on the thumbnail uh, we'd like to see some more european or asia or the uk we've got a couple from europe a couple from the uk i think we even had one from japan which was really cool um, but yeah, anyway, if you have some in Canada, in Mexico, South America, wherever, we're going to make some more thumbnails in the next month or so. And uh, that's it for me. I still don't know what happened with that emergency outside. Um, I think it's got something to do with the works they're doing. They may have hit a gas line. I think that's possibly what happened, is they accidentally hit some sort of uh, pressurized line. By the way, I want to thank Sean. Sean, thank you very much for being the donation for tonight. I, I do appreciate it and uh, it is very kind of you. The uh, show is a lot of work. So uh, people like you are the people that keep it going. So thank you very, very much. And um, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow night. See you later, everyone. Bye-bye.